want to turn our hearts to, to your word now and this important subject of uh, discipleship, what it means to be a, a disciple of, uh, of Jesus Christ, Lord. As we uh, look at it, Lord, we pray that you'd bring, uh, again, just uh, a correction, uh, Lord, and just uh, uh, bring us to that, that understanding of what it means to really uh, walk with you and serve you, have that eternal perspective, Lord, that our our lives would really uh, count for your kingdom and, uh, and bring you glory. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In, uh, in 1519, uh, Hernando Cortez is the explorer that left Cuba on what would be the, uh, I think, either the third or the fourth attempt to uh, land in Mexico and, and uh, go forward there with uh, exploration because there had been three failed attempts previous to him. Uh, he did something that some of the other guys didn't do, and that is as he landed on the shores there, he actually beached the boats, which would be highly unusual, and then and some accounts then have him burning the boats to the ground. Uh, he wanted to make sure the 600 guys with him were committed to the mission. Uh, there would be no return, obviously. They would either go forward and uh, complete the mission or die trying, basically, but there would be uh, no boats to go home in. And uh, in a sense, uh, Jesus is taking his guys up to Caesarea Philippi. We looked at that on a map and some pictures last week to, in a sense, lay out this now account to make sure they understand really who he is, his identity, why he came, what his mission was going to be, which, um, again, their understanding had to be at this point, and, and we, we saw that last week. They understand that he is the Son of Man, the title of Daniel for the Messiah. They realize and have already made a few confessions of the fact that he's the, the son of God, the Messiah. Yet at this point, we saw last week, there's a, still a dread confrontation from him to them. What do other people say? Okay, now, who do you say? You know, where, where, where does your commitment lie? And of course, we get the confession of Peter that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. At that point, then, he's going to lead them into a, a, a very simple discourse that we're all pretty probably familiar with on what it means to really be a disciple and to, uh, and to follow him. But again, taking them to this place of, uh, of no return. Last week, we looked at the fact that uh, early on in the chapters in verses 1 to 4, he confirmed his identity or said that he would confirm it with one final sign, the sign of Jonah. Uh, in terms of death and resurrection. We talked about the importance of that. That becomes the foundational teaching and proof for who Jesus was in the book of Acts, the epistles, and really the, the preaching or for the last 2,000 years. He cautions then the disciples to guard against false teaching that he likened to yeast, that again, the yeast in the loaf of bread, a tiny amount will make its way all the way through. We talked about how there was a point in time, a split in the teaching of, uh, of the church uh, when uh, the, the allegorical teaching of Scripture became the rule of the day via Origen and guys like Augustine there in Alexandria. And, uh, and, and everything changed from that point. We moved away from a, a, a literal uh, teaching of Scripture, which again, that false teaching continues to plague the church today, and we talked about some of its ramifications. As we get to point three in this message, we'll see that uh, again, Jesus confronts the disciples uh, concerning his identity, or excuse me, as we did that last week, and then that's where we have the uh, again the confession of Peter that was uh, that was correct and then authenticated by uh, by Christ. It's going to look at what would be uh, the fourth thing in this chapter. Jesus communicates the plan of redemption to his disciples in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, 
Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So again, the the revelation here of the plan of redemption, uh, which includes His suffering, His death, and His his resurrection. Well, certainly Jesus had already alluded to this uh, on several occasions, but uh, keep in mind, uh, because of the context that they were living under the uh, oppression of the Roman Empire, a great desire to see the Messiah come. Jesus authenticates through his birth, through his miracles, and so forth. He's the Messiah, and uh, they're they're on board for this messianic kingdom to come throughout the Romans, establish his kingdom, and uh, so on and so forth, because that's all prophesied in in the Old Testament. What they are having a hard time getting their mind around at this point, and it says, and Jesus began to teach, which means this is the beginning, but he's going to continue over and over and over to try to get them to see the concept of the plan of redemption, and he came to die for their sins. Now, early on in John's gospel and uh, in chapter one, we've got Peter's brother, uh, Andrew, who is a disciple of John the Baptist, another unknown or unnamed disciple uh, there with John. And John, when he sees Jesus, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Now, we all look at and go, yeah, he's the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God. They wouldn't have quite seen it that way, of course. Again, they just don't have the concept that Jesus Christ is going to come himself in the flesh and, and die for the sins of the world. They're still looking for Jesus as being the conquering king. So we read those things and we have one picture. They read them and they still are, you know, don't really, really get it. Now, in, uh, in later in John's gospel in chapter three, Jesus teaching says, just as Moses uh, lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man will be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We're thinking lifted up like on a cross, but I, I don't think they're really grasping that. And of course, the familiar verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus is beginning to and will continue to to try to help them understand the plan of redemption, which was his going to the cross for our sins, dying on the cross uh, and being raised to life again on, on the third day. And then here's where we get uh, this uh, statement by Peter. Uh, the plan of redemption, we would say, must be accepted and not challenged or refused because that's what really Peter is doing here. Now, in a sense, Peter loved Jesus. So the idea that I'm going to go and suffer, I'm going to die, and he's not really hearing the raise to life, nor does he really grasp the concept of of why Jesus is doing this, he jumps right in and never. <laughs> We're not going to let this happen. You know, and of course, uh, we know that Peter was right there, sword in hand, <laughs> in the garden to try to prevent the uh, uh, arrest and, and, and so forth. Now, sometimes we, we see that uh, Jesus says these remarks to Peter and go, well, I guess that straightened him out. But I think we miss a lot of the, I think, the importance of what's actually being said here. Jesus says that when Peter does this, he's speaking against the plans of God. He's speaking against the plans of God, and therefore, he's really, what he's saying, these concepts or his idea against the plans of God, against the will of God, in this case, against the will and the word of God, when he's coming against them, he's really doing this, and it's inspired by by Satan, Jesus says. Uh, He says that you're an offense to me. He says that you're a stumbling block to me. And uh, this has a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of applications uh, to us. When God tells us something in His Word, when we know what His will is, and we say, ah. <laughs> well, I'm not doing it, then Jesus would say, you're an offense to me. And what you're doing is against the will and the Word of God, and you're opening your life up to deception and the lie of Satan. That's what Peter's doing here, right? That's what Jesus is saying to him. And so there's a a, a huge, huge application to this in our life because we certainly wouldn't do a show of hands, but there's probably times in all of our lives when we know what God's will is and we don't do it. We know what God's will is and things we shouldn't be doing and we do them anyway. We know what God's will is and things we should be doing 
and we fail to do them. And when we do that, we're really opening our lives up to tremendous spiritual deception to the lies of the enemy. And again, Jesus, I don't think he just throws comments around like, hey, I couldn't think of what else to say, so I'll just throw this in. No, I think this is a very crucial, a very important statement. He's, he's getting them to realize who he is. He says that Peter's statement, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the foundation of the whole church is going to be built upon. So obviously, these are very pivotal words of Jesus here. I want, to, I want to give you just a, 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 an example from uh, the context of marriage. Read a little, couple little quotes from an article called Choices, because uh, uh, we all have choices to make. Uh, but also this idea of what went wrong with, uh, with Peter. You know, obviously he's not in God's will at this point. Uh, and the first thing to mention uh, is the idea of his perspective and his priorities. First is perspective. We like Peter... Sometimes we will miss God's will because Peter it really isn't getting it at this point. Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. This is my will. Hey, no way. That's not going to happen. You know, Peter thinks he's doing the right thing. He's totally, totally missed it. He's spiritually deceived. Well, Peter had the, the wrong perspective. Jesus says to him, what you have in mind is the things of men and not the things of God. Your perspective is on your life and your thing right now. Your perspective. It's really not on the kingdom of God. It's not on heaven. We sometimes talk about the fact that we need an eternal perspective. And I think the eternal perspective can just be summed up in the idea it's the reality of heaven. If heaven is really real and it's for all eternity and that's where we're going then that should, that should really change our, our perspective of life. About uh, 20 years ago, when we first started a, a radio ministry on K-Light for the first time, I was still on staff with Bill. We were getting ready to launch out and do the church here in, in Kailua. Uh, and he said, hey, you know, we're going to put you on the radio on Saturday night and, you know, uh, start recording some of those messages from actually the home fellowship that was actually going to be... Uh, re rebroadcast. Uh, we've since burned all those tapes, but uh, but anyway, that's what was going to go out over the uh, the radio and everything. And he said, uh, "Go up and see uh, Naylene. That was Bill's daughter, and she was actually running K Light at the uh, at the time. And and uh, you'll need to kind of hammer out a little introduction and conclusion and all that, uh, you know, to so we could get this thing going." So I went up to see her, and uh, K Light's facilities were in the Empress Theater was right upstairs, and. And uh, told her what was going on. She goes, okay, well, what's the name of your program? Okay, well, that's a good question. <laughs> and uh, we kind of kicked that around a little bit. And, and I said, well, let's call it a, a view from Calvary. Because I, I believed at that point in time, I could see God having worked in my life, that once you come to Calvary, not the church, once you come to the cross and you understand the plan of redemption, that Jesus died for our sins, and that uh, He gives us His Holy Spirit to change us, then every view of life should change at that, that point. At that time, as a professional artist, I saw my view of art completely change over those four or five years or whatever that I had been walking with the Lord. Finances, the way we were going to raise our kids. Every area of my life, I saw that God had something to say. He had a perspective that was right. And if I didn't follow it, then it was because I was being deceived and I needed to kind of get my thinking right, which is one of the reasons we, you know, recently did the whole truth project to see, have a Christian perspective. Again, a Christian perspective is an eternal perspective, uh, the idea of heaven. And that's what we should be living for. I want to, I got kind of corrected on this a couple of years ago again, because it's an ongoing thing. We just kind of, it's so easy to get pretty earthly bound here in terms of our thinking and our perspective. Uh, we had missionaries that were from the church here uh, serving in a Muslim country uh, at the time. This was about two years ago. And there was a, a fellow in the news from that particular country. And because this gets broadcast later, I can't really fill in all the details, names and so forth. Uh, but, um, there was a guy in that country who had uh, been raised in that country as a Muslim uh, because of a war in that country, had fled to a neighboring country and there heard the gospel, received Christ, been walking with the Lord for about 10 years. Uh, when the war ended, like a lot of uh, folks, he 
immigrated back to that country of his birth, day, birth at that, that point as a Christian. Well, as the new government, after this warfare had ended, set up, uh, he, he was there and, and was arrested for because he had gone against the anti-conversion laws of that country. It was against the law to convert from one religion to another religion. Makes evangelism a little difficult. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the penalty for that was death. And so uh, because of our involvement in that country uh, at the time as a government, our State Department was involved. It was in the national media here uh, for a bit. Christians were praying, very concerned over this man and his family and what would become of them. And in the West here, we were praying, of course, for his safety, for God to protect him, for him somehow to get off on these charges. We we're praying for him to, you know, be uh, maybe him and his whole family extricated, taken out of the country where they were saved. There were people in this country saying, we will welcome them into our home if you can get them out. And that's kind of what we were praying for, very concerned about this Christian man who is being persecuted unjustly so, uh, and it's uh, raised to a, a national and international level. Now, I'm emailing with our missionary uh, in, in country there, and he told me that's not what they were praying for at all. In fact, they, they were glad to see this happen. Everybody was talking about it. Christianity. Will a Christian stand for his faith and die for his faith like a Muslim will? Is this Christianity real? Do they really believe in heaven? Do they really believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior? So they were praying, they were praying that he would go to trial. He'd be found guilty and he'd be executed, hopefully on national television. And everybody would see it. Everybody would know about it. And he knew that it would strengthen the body of Christ. Other people would come forward. Maybe it would even lead to a bit of a revival in that country. Wow, that's a little different, wasn't it, than what we were framed for here. Who do you think had the eternal perspective? I think those guys did. I, I think they weren't worried about that guy's life in this world. They knew that he was going to be with the Lord. They were worried about other people's lives and whether they would be in heaven as well, whether other Christians would be strengthened and stand for what Christ told them to stand for. Because as we get into when he lays out what a disciple is, Part of it is the, the suffering, the death, and so on and so forth that we are to anticipate in this life. Very different perspective. And I, got, <laughs> I had to kind of, wow, I've got to change gears here. I've got to shift here. There's another area where God is constantly trying to bring us back so that we're not spiritually deceived. Uh, very, very important. Peter had a problem. He had the wrong perspective. Secondly, Peter had a problem because he had wrong priorities. Until Peter was filled with the Spirit of God, he had a tendency to argue with God's Word. And we kind of get a kick out of it sometimes. You know, Peter's <laughs> arguing with Jesus and, uh, and so forth. Not that any of us would ever do that. Uh, no, in reality, uh, again, anytime we are arguing with Jesus, arguing with the will of God, arguing with uh, the, the Word of God, we're falling into a sense of spiritual deception. Uh, we've become an offense uh, to Jesus, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we're, we're really missing it in terms of the priorities of, of our life. G Peter did not understand the relationship between suffering and glory. And also, Peter did understand that his fate, those guys with him, were intrinsically tied to Jesus at this point. He is their master. Uh, they are his disciples. And if he's going to die on a cross somewhere, okay, <laughs> that's probably what was going to happen to them too. So there's, a, there's an element that, that Peter's very concerned because he loves Jesus. There's another element that he's very concerned because he loves me. <laughs> he loves himself. <laughs> he didn't exactly you know, have that dialed in when he, when he uh, left those fish in the nets and followed Jesus. That, that's what they were uh, in for. He didn't understand the idea of a tie between suffering and, uh, and glory, but he would get it. And when he writes his very first epistle that we have, he mentions the subject several times. I've given you the reference, but one of them in 1 Peter 4.12 says, uh, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. 
If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of, gl- of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any, any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Up to this point, again, without the Spirit of God, before the, uh, the Spirit is poured out on the church and they receive the Spirit of God, Peter's pretty much concerned with his safety and his own self-protected uh, life. And because of that, his priorities are wrong in terms of, of uh, what God's will is. Uh, again, anytime we argue with God's word, we're opening a door for Satan's lies. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, the great British preacher of a couple of generations ago, says, The man who loves Jesus but who shuns God's method is a stumbling block to him. I read uh, uh, an, an article, and this is the one that's by, it's called Choices. It's by a pastor named uh, Paul Borden. And he's just talking about the fact that in the context of marriage in particular, you know, the Ephesians 5, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, wives submit to your husbands. And, uh, and we know there's more to say about that. Care to one another. Before that, there's to be a mutual submission to one another. I dare say in a lot of Christians' homes, this is not exact. There's a little arguing that goes on over this particular subject. And when it goes on and when it happens, both sides are arguing against the will of God for their marriage and the word of God. And they open up their lives and their family to spiritual deception and spiritual lies, which really, uh, again, opens the door for other problems. Let me just read a couple of paragraphs. Uh, He says in terms of men, we men don't look at marriage that way, uh, often uh, the way it should be biblically. He says to us, marriage is another contract. It's another business deal. It's another mountain to climb. It's another goal to reach. My wife says to me, you know, before we were married, you were so patient. Yeah, I was patient. I had a goal. I had to woo this girl. I had to get her to like me. I had to get her engaged to me. I had to convince her parents to let her marry me. And once we got married, it was time to get on with life. I have a career to build. Sometimes that's the attitude of a lot lot of guys. No nudging and no showing of hands. But uh, that's the uh, the attitude of the world uh, very, very often. And then there's the the gals, he says. A wife looks at marriage and assumes that six months or a year after her wedding, her husband will still come gliding into the house after work, sweep her off her feet and kiss her passionately. But soon she starts to think, that's not the way it is. He's got other things to do. He doesn't care about me. So she chooses not to obey the word of God. She says, instead, I'm going to find my, my fulfillment in my friends. I'll find it in my work. I'll find it in the children. And yet the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Care for one another. We say, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to make that choice. And God says, fine. I'll let you live with the consequences then. And he does. Further down in the articles, he says, we wonder why there's so many divorces even among Christians. We wondered why married people live as singles under the same roof. Why there's arguing and fighting and straining. It's because people choose not to obey the word of God. We have a Peter problem when it comes to marriage. But that's just one aspect of what the Bible Bible says. You know, every week we come in here and I read the Bible, I explain the Bible, and I say how it applies to us. And every week we've got to decide whether to obey it or not. Right? Uh, And and the areas where uh, we're not in obedience to it, that's when we're to repent, change our thinking, change our behavior. And if we don't, we become spiritually deceived and we kind of open the door. I mean, Peter is right there. He's walk, physically walking with Jesus, hearing him teach uh, every, every day, seeing all, all of the miracles and yet so deceived at this point. So in communicating the plan of redemption, uh, it cannot be refused or argued with and neither can the basic tenets of what the Bible teaches us uh, as well. Otherwise, we're going to be in in real trouble. We need to get, again, uh, eternal perspective, the right perspective, right priorities. The, the, the fifth thing in this list, starting from last week, is that Jesus explains the conditions and the cost for being his disciple. And that's uh, verses 24 to 28, a very classic passage of Scripture. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself 
Take up his cross and follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So very simply, Jesus calls us to discipleship. Our language, we might say apprenticeship. It's a hands-on learning. It requires a, a few things. John Wesley says that, uh, that before the fall of man, there was one road and it led right to God. He says after the fall of man, there were two roads. One road led right to God and the other one led right to self. And, uh, and Jesus says, you've got to change roads if you're going to uh, uh, come after me. Greg Laurie in his book, Discipleship, says, It's my conviction that every disciple is a believer, but not every believer is a disciple. Jesus clearly calls all believers to be disciples. When we fail to respond to his call, we fall short of his perfect will and miss out on living the Christian life as it was truly meant to be lived. Uh, again, I don't know if you've heard that before, but again, all disciples are believers, but not all believers are disciples. And yet that's what Jesus is calling them to and us to. And in a little bit, he's up there at Caesarea Philippi burning the boats and going, going forward here with the, with the mission. And uh, I'm going to die for your sins. And here's what I'm calling you to do uh, as you come along with me. Very important. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, who was uh, uh, a great Christian writer, says that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. It's not that it's been found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. You know, I, I meet people once in a while, you know, and trying to share with them and so forth. And sometimes you'll get that line or that response. Oh, I tried Christianity. Didn't work for me. Oh, really? What exactly did you try? <laughs> it probably wasn't this. <laughs> it probably wasn't the cost and the condition that Jesus laid out here. He makes it very clear. Two approaches to life. Deny yourself or live for yourself. Take up your cross or ignore the cross. Follow Christ or follow the world. Lose your life for his sake or save your life for your own sake. Forsake the world or gain the world. Keep your soul or lose your soul. Share in His reward and glory or lose the reward and glory. I heard uh, uh, Greg Laurie uh, uh, earlier in the week. I was driving around, uh, having to catch him. Uh, and he was kind of talking about a little bit of an overlap with the subject. He was in Philippians 2. And he was just talking about this idea of the pursuit of happiness and how important it is, and that's the drive for most people, certainly in our, in our own uh, culture, uh, that uh, has just in the last couple of generations really, really moved in, in that direction. You know, generations before us uh, live for this, the, the generations behind them, wanting to make a better life for their children or their children's children and, uh, and so forth. But we've become very myopic, very, very selfish in terms of uh, uh, everything that we seek to do. And there is the pursuit of happiness. Uh, but again, uh, the pursuit of happiness never leads to happiness. Uh, other, otherwise, there would, uh, there would be a lot, a lot of other people that are successful and rich and what we consider happy uh, or should be that are not. Uh, Malcolm McGregridge, who is a great uh, British uh, writer, journalist for a number of years and was kind of a, a radical guy and basically a wild man, drunker, gambler and roamed the world and uh, writing for newspapers and stories and so forth. But uh, at a point in time in his adult life later on, he... He uh, came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, re received Christ as his Lord and Savior, and, and then wrote a book called The Wasted Years, uh, and then went on to really become a, an apologist for the Christian faith. He was a great thinker. Uh, he said this in, in one of his articles, I can say that I never knew what joy was like until I gave up pursuing happiness or cared to live until I chose to die for these two discoveries I'm beholding to Jesus. The pursuit of happiness doesn't really bring any happiness, uh, but the right perspective in walking with the Lord will in terms of discipleship. So what is it? Well, 
Jesus gives us four basic principles. One is discipleship involves a life of self-denial. That's not the same as self-discipline. Self-discipline is, uh, is, uh, is what I exercise when I open that refrigerator in there and there's still cheesecake left from the previous Wednesday night. If I shut the door and walk away, that's self-discipline, <laughs> and, uh, which I, I don't always do, which... Uh, has led to me trying to buy, uh, you know, shirts that are a little looser fitting. Have you seen some of those shirts there today? They have a bulge right here in them. I've I, I noticed some of you guys are wearing those shirts too. I'm trying not to buy any more of those, you know, trying to stay away from those kind of shirts. But uh, uh, self-discipline, you know, keeps uh, whether you work out or not, it's all about self-discipline. That's not the same thing as, as self-denial. Self-denial that Jesus is talking about here means you basically deny your life and, and you, you walk in the, the best you can in the will of, of God and you, and you follow him. Uh, th there's uh, two aspects of this. Both are very important. <clears throat> uh, again, illustrate this by a guy that feels God's calling him to the mission field. Uh, and uh, he struggles with that. But then he decides he wants to be in the center of God's will to deny himself, his goals, his plans, what he thought would be best for his life. And now he's going to deny himself and follow the Lord. He goes to the mission field. You know, he, he leaves friends and family and creature comforts behind. And God bless him. We'd say he's in the center of God's will. He denied himself and he's picked up his cross. He's following Jesus. Now, it doesn't help, though, if uh, while he's there serving the Lord, he goes online every day and watches pornography. We would say, no, well, yeah, he's kind of living the, <laughs> the, the life Jesus called him to, but not really. Why? Because he's not doing it every day. Daily, we are to, certainly in the big picture of our, our goals, our plans, and those things, we're to be submitting those things to the Lord. But every day that we get up, we need to be submitting ourselves to, to God's will again that day and the next day uh, in the next day. Daily taking our personal goals and our life and submitting them to the Lordship of Christ. Secondly, discipleship involves a cross we're to carry. And again, in the Roman world, this meant shame and guilt and suffering and, and rejection and something that Jesus was very familiar about. And, um, uh, and uh, early on, when Jesus was about 11 years old, uh, in a village four miles away, just over the hill to the north of Nazareth, Sephorus, there was a man named Judas of Galilee that raised up and called himself a bit of a, a, a messiah and so forth and led a, a rebellion against Rome. It's not the same Judas that we find later in the Gospels. Uh, at that point in time, the Roman legions move in, wipe out the, the city of Sephorus, pretty much uh, kill uh, everybody who isn't killed uh, many of them were sold into slavery. Uh, those that were combatants, there were about 2,000 of them. And so Rome crucified every one of them. So anybody that, even an 11-year-old boy, that walked to the top of that hill and looked on that city burning could see 2,000 people nailed to Roman crosses. This was a common thing. And when we think about Jesus dying on a cross and the horrors of it, it was a common thing. Everybody knew what a cross was. Everybody knew uh, what was meant by it. Uh, the person that carried the cross, it meant he was on his way to death. It meant that he, at a point in time, had, had broke the law of Rome. And now Rome was forcing him to submit to that law as they nailed the, the title of his crimes on top of that cross. Uh, and he was crucified for it. They would get you to submit in a way, one way or another. So Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, again, sometimes we call this a radical call to discipleship. You know what I want to say? This is a normal call to discipleship. I think it's the only one. <laughs> we just don't hear it a lot. The normal call, the normal Christian life is you deny yourself daily, submitting your will to the will of God daily, normal. Second, you pick up not Jesus's cross. He says, pick up your cross. So it's a life of saying that, man, this is it. I'm committed. I'm following Jesus. He went to a cross. He died. I'm going to die daily. I need to die to myself uh, and my own selfish desires. Uh, and sometimes in this life, that does mean persecution as, uh, and, uh, and even death as many around the world face that today. Those are the two. Did you ever take a discipleship class and cover this? 
<laughs> you know, most discipleship classes that you get as a new believer, you, you, teach, you learn doctrines of the church and Christian faith and why you should be baptized and stuff, which is good. Uh, it, it, interesting. We may have to change, change the course here. The third thing is uh, discipleship involves an example to follow. Jesus calls us to follow him. Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And he says, whoever loses his life for me will, will save it. And certainly that seems like foolishness to people in this world. Kind of the classic line uh, uh, in regards to this application is from the journals of Jim Elliott. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And of course, you know the story of Jim Elliott and his friends uh, who died at the hands of the Alka Indians that they were trying to bring uh, the gospel to. Well, Jim was no fool. He, he could not keep life uh, you know, on this earth. He was going to live it for the Lord to gain that which he could not lose, which is to be in Christ's presence, to receive his, his reward. And therefore, this idea of submission to the Lord should be a blessing. It certainly is the prudent thing to do. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be given to you as well. And it should be a, a joy to submit our will to him. If we understand who it is that we're, we're following. Um, now, now that your, your heads are kind of getting lower and lower, let me read one more quote from, uh, from uh, C.S. Lewis here. It kind of summarizes the whole thing. Christ says, quote, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it. I want to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think are innocent, as well as the ones that you think are wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own shall become yours. The life that we give to Christ, then <laughs> he gives back to us, but it, it's so much better. Uh, it's it's a it's a life that's lived out through him and through the power of his uh, his Holy Spirit. And uh, again, critical, foundational to being a disciple. The fourth thing is discipleship involves a promised kingdom. And uh, again, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very soul as if you could gain the whole world? If you could, it still wouldn't be worth it in, in terms of Jesus uh, what he's saying here. We mentioned this a couple of weeks ago going through the Psalms. But again, it would be the idea that if you could gain the whole world, if you could be the richest person in this life, and you could have that, you would be better off being a beggar who every day never knew where another crumb of food was ever coming from and have eternal life in Jesus Christ. If you had the choice to beg for every crumb of food your whole life, but to, but to go and be with the Lord forever in heaven versus being the richest person in this life and end up in hell, which, which would you choose? If you were the, could be the greatest athlete in this life and, uh, and could do all these astounding things and all the fame that would come with it versus being a person that suffers physical uh, problems your, your whole life. Live your whole life in agony and pain. But go to heaven forever with the Lord. Would that be better than being the greatest athlete in this life? And Jesus would say, you'd be better off being that poor person that begged every day, live every moment of your life in pain, and be with Him forever. It's quite a contrast. And yet so often we're, we don't say, well, I don't really want to be the richest, just... Somewhere up there would be good. <laughs> I don't exactly have to be totally pain-free, uh, but you know, somewhere middle ground would, would be good uh, as well. Uh, and again, Jesus is insane that if you come to me, I promise you pain every day and never have a dime to your name. That's not the idea. But he just says, come to me and surrender all these things and then trust me uh, each and every day for how I might care for you and how I might provide for you. And he does say there's a reward in the future. Discipleship offers a promise of a future world. Paul says 
In Ephesians 6, 7, serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And then Jesus says, when he comes again, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has is, is done. And again, about uh, a week later, they see the fulfillment of, uh, of verse 27. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see uh, the kingdom of God. I, uh, I read this uh, in a New Tribes missionary newsletter a number of years ago that I thought was uh, 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 an important statement. Uh, the anonymous writer says, Our greatest fear should never be failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. And I'm afraid there's a, there's a lot of people that succeed in this life in things that in the final analysis don't really matter. Our greatest fear should not be failure, <laughs> but succeeding in things that don't really matter. Warren Wordsby says of the person who's a true disciple, he becomes more like Jesus Christ and one day shares in his glory. Satan promises you glory, but in the end you receive suffering. God promises you suffering, but in the end that suffering is transformed into glory. <laughs> so which would you rather, which route wrote, uh, the road to God or the road to self? Uh, the road of, uh, of following God's will and His Word are the one that argues against it all the time, opening your life to spiritual uh, deception. Uh, Satan promises uh, glory, and in the end you get suffering. God promises suffering, but will transform you in the midst of it uh, in, into glory, and very often in this life as well as the, the life to come. I... Uh, I, uh, I heard me on the radio this week. <laughs> I was driving along. And, uh, and I, uh, I'll usually listen because these messages are like three years old. And it's like, oh my gosh, what did I say? And uh, it was interesting. It was the parallel passage in Luke that we're teaching on this week. So I thought, okay, I'm going to listen to the rest of this. And uh, it was funny. I was also kind of chuckling to myself, of course, because I was telling a story uh, that... Uh, I didn't share in the first service, but I, I think it's appropriate. It's, it's, um, uh, and uh, bear with me, it's another kayak story. But uh, uh, nonetheless, it was uh, the one when we were on the big island and, and we had some equipment problems and, and so forth. And uh, we, um, and uh, Kevin and I and Strat and then uh, Rob, one of the other brothers, were the, one of the last ones to leave and get in the water. And, and we had equipment problems. So we, we were getting guys in the water at seven in the morning. We're up at, you know, five or five thirty and getting guys out in the water. And, and again, these kayak trips, we're on the big island. And we've got to paddle open ocean to get to uh, another destination, probably uh, eight or nine miles in, in open ocean. And we need to get out and get there before the winds kick, kick up. You've got that. Uh, we're on the north side and uh, so you got the prevailing winds that will kind of push you down down the coast but late in the afternoon uh, can get all white capped and can get kind of nasty and, and so that's what had happened the four of us and uh, without a lot of other details so we're we're moving down down there and um, uh, we're we're at we're coming to a point where there's a big peninsula sticking out it's just a, a sheer cliff rocky shoreline and of course the prevailing winds the trades are blowing pretty hard and it's uh, it's pretty nasty and uh, and it's all pushing so we're coming down and you got to you either have to make it around the point or be driven into the cliff and die those are the two options a b so to say it is a pretty much a full tilt adrenaline thing for that that last you're re you're really concerned all the way and then you're just crazy concerned and just paddling like crazy to try to get around the point there's a couple of obstacles though uh, Strad and Kevin are in a two-man kayak ahead of us, and it's rough and it's bumpy. And uh, Kevin is uh, is uh, feeding the fish at this point, and uh, and that's not good because I know that this is kind of a sharky area that we've got to get through and get to the other side. So that's that's not a good thing. Uh, so Strat's pretty much digging, you know, uh, for everything he's got. Uh, I've got. I'm trying to hang back with Rob because he's in a inflatable kayak which is kind of like paddling a giant marshmallow it just doesn't it just doesn't move through the 
incredibly stable. You know, if you're going this like this, it's not going to tip over. I mean, it's like a caterpillar on the waves, you know, great lifeboat, but it really, it's difficult. And, uh, and I'm trying to hang back with him as much as I can. I, I'm in a kayak that I've borrowed and it's got hatches and the hatches are both leak. And with all the white caps, my, my kayak is sinking. It's uh, pretty much full of water. And <clears throat> once that happens, they'll reach a point where they get too much water and then they, they turn upside down, which makes it even more difficult with the cliff and the waves and then, you know, so then you're going to die. So, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be as pastoral as I can with Rob here, but there's a point in time where I realize I'm close to that point. It's getting very unstable. So I say to Rob, uh, God bless you. I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here. You know, I said, I've got to, my boat sinking. I got to try to, I just got to start digging, you know, to try to get around it. Uh, just keep heading that way, you know, and, you know, just stay away from the cliff. And then my plan was paddle as fast as I could <clears throat> catch Strat. And then when my boat sank, I would just dive and hang on the back of, uh, uh, of his kayak and let him pull me around and hope that we all didn't get eaten by sharks. Uh, so that was my, my plan. But we made it around, and Rob made it around, and we came in this little cove, and it's, it's dark by then, so we're not going to be able to complete the trip where everybody else is waiting for us, wondering what's going on. There's two fire rescue helicopters uh, overhead. And we told, were told later, ready to make a four-man rescue. Uh, we came into this little cove. Looks good. We're camping here for the night. And uh, so we, we climb up this plateau, and I run up to the cliff to make a phone call to, uh, to Kathy to say we're okay. These are the old days of analog, so if you had a line of sight, then you could make a cell call, which, uh, which we did. And she's like, okay, great. And... Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, here comes a fireman out of nowhere. So he had landed on one of the ridges and, and walked down. Uh, and the four of us there are totally exhausted, on the verge of being delirious, actually. And he says, um, uh, you know, I got another seat in the helicopter. Anybody want to be rescued? Rob goes, I do. And he just starts walking with the guy. Absolutely no hesitation. He left his kayak. He left his clothes. He left his packs, his dry bags, his tent, water, everything. I mean, there was absolutely no hesitation. Anybody want to be re We're like, well, there wasn't even a does any of you. It was just, I do. And he just started walking. And they walked off. And there goes Rob. <laughs> it's just like... Wow. <laughs> well, see, in a sense, that's what Jesus is saying to these guys and to us. If you really think it through, the stuff you're leaving behind, whatever you think you might be leaving behind by following him and serving him, it's nothing. This is a rescue operation here when Jesus says, come, be my disciple. Oh, yeah, you go this, this and this. I don't care. I'm just going because the rest of this stuff is burning anyway. I'm out of here. What, what else? You know, what else have we got to do? Compared to my life before, what my life could become without you, yeah, rescue, I'm here, I'm in. Again, so important that when we look at these things that Jesus is saying, uh, it's, it's just logical, it makes sense. He's a God who cares for us. He's a God who loves us. Makes all the sense in the world <laughs> to get up every day and submit my life to Him. And if it means denying self, hey, I'm in. <clears throat> Carrying a cross, okay, not going to always be easy every day. You know, there's there's going to be some difficulty along the way. <clears throat> I'm still I'm still in. Follow me. I'm glad I got an example to follow. Reward in heaven. Not my big concern right now. I'm just more concerned in the rescue mission itself, and uh, and following Jesus. Again could be seen as, as, as a radical call to discipleship. I just think it's the, the normal call to discipleship and the one that, that makes sense if we, if we think it through. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do re rejoice that uh, You rescued us. Sometimes we even sing that, sing songs about it, Lord. I pray that as we consider, Lord, Your identity as the Messiah, your proof, the one final sign, the sign of Jonah, your death and resurrection. Lord, that as we place our, our faith in you, we're forgiven of our sins. I pray then at that point, we would, uh, we would follow you. When you come and say, I'm here to rescue you, we would just not even really look about the stuff that might uh, 
be left behind and we would just be so anxious to to walk with you and, and follow you and and trust you each and every day. And uh, pray that you would, again, just continue to uh, encourage us from your word, strengthen us, Lord, as we uh, seek to be your, your disciples. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
lift up our hands We meet us here as we call on your name We need us here we have come to this place to worship you God of mercy and grace it is you we adore it is you praise is up for only you heavens declare Stop. 